As a young boy, I was obsessed with football. I would kick the ball high into the power lines and wait for it to bounce back to earth. I'd play out a game in my imagination. I was Matthew Richardson. Richard, I just want to paint the picture of my level of fandom. Because you were mad, Richard. I was mad. Yeah, yeah. I, was, I was a mad tiger. To put it into sort of context, I had, I had your poster on my wall. It's mid-90s. And I wrote a letter to the Richmond Footy Club. I wanted yeah. to do work experience. And I, they put me in the video department with yeah. Paulie. And it was yeah. the VHS yeah. era. And I put in a highlights tape and I sat there with the headphones on pick up the story from there, as, as you remember it. Well, I, I walked into the video room and I went over to get my tape, my highlights tape. I think I'd had a good game, Bobby, so <laughs> you did, you did. I was you... looking forward to watching it. <laughs> <laughs> and I saw this little kid sitting in there, little skinny uh, kid, watching my tape. And I thought, what's this kid doing? So I just tapped you on the shoulder and I said, do you mind if I have a look at that champ? <laughs> Can you believe I called you champ? Oh, it was, it's, it's one of my favourite stories, but I was a young kid and I look back and, you know, you're a big man, six foot six. I'm was, embarrassed, man. Can I take you back? You're the son of Alan Bull Richardson, right. who was a Tiger Premiership player. Yeah. How, what yeah. did you know about the Tigers? Well, I guess my old man finished in 1975. That was the year I was born, so I never yeah. actually saw him play. As a kid, I guess, growing up, I got my love for Richmond through Dad's scrapbooks. Like, his, his mum had kept these amazing scrapbooks. So, as a kid, I remember just pouring through them, reading every article. So, I learned a lot of the history of the Richmond Footy Club through the scrapbooks. And yeah. the only footage we had was a VHS tape, a bit like my, my highlights tape, Bobby. And it was the 1967 Premiership, and I just remember I watched that a lot as a kid. So, yeah. were you, how fanatical were you as a, as a young kid growing up in, in Tassie? Were yeah. you... Were you... Were you a full-on Tiger yeah. supporter? Yeah, I was. I remember um, I'd lie in the lounge room and, and you know, get the AM, FM radio on trying to find the band that the Richmond game was on. So, yeah, yeah very passionate. You, you always played with, with such emotion, you sort of with the heart on the sleeve when you got to the Tiger. What, were you, what, what, was, what was the junior footballer or junior sportsman Richo like? Pretty, uh, looking back, pretty selfish, I'd say, <laughs> <laughs> It was all about me. In fact, <laughs> mum, mum tells a story. She used to be embarrassed in mini league because um, I'd play in the ruck in mini league and you'd almost tap it to yourself and <laughs> run down, have a bounce and then slot a goal. I guess I was pretty determined, you know, I always yeah. wanted to be a good player. I didn't take feedback too well, I guess you'd say. Um, yeah, but just passionate, I guess I yeah. was, yeah. How old were you when you thought I'd... I, I might be a chance to get drafted and come over yeah. to the mainland. Was that kind of always on your radar of trying to get over to the to the um, AFL? Probably when you get to high school. I think when you make a state team, you know, you go away on a carnival. I remember going up to Brisbane in 1990 to the under-16 carnival and you can tell who the recruiters are. Yeah, you know, right, the cars yeah. are parked around the boundary line. and Got the clipboards out. Got the clipboards. Suspicious eyes. Yeah. I, I remember we got a letter in the mail from the Brisbane line saying to nominate for the draft. Right. That was, it was Big. like... Oh, it's massive. Yeah. It was that was that was almost a bigger moment than getting yeah. drafted. Which I'm, they probably sent out a thousand letters. Yeah, but it was oh, like Charlie would've. Bucket and the Golden Ticket. Yeah, I actually came over before the draft, Bob. I was lucky with the father and son rule back then. I actually signed up and um, a four year contract. And I remember I came to the 1992 Grand Final. I met Johnny Northey, who had just been appointed oh, wow. coach. Swooper. Swooper said, um, "Get ready, because we'll be doing." Um, a hundred hundreds on the first night of training. A hundred hundreds. But you could run. I could, but... You were, you were, you were an elite runner, but that's still a hundred hundreds. That's daunting, still, though, isn't uh, it? Horrible. I worked in the city in William Street. Yeah. I lived out in Vermont, so I drove in from Vermont seven o'clock in the morning, got into the city. You worked eight till four. What were you driving? I was driving a 1979 VB Commodore. <laughs> So I'd drive that into the city, you'd work 8 till 4 and then you'd go to training at Punt Road. You wouldn't finish training till 8, 8.30 at night, then drive back to Vermont, so it was did, hard work. Did you play many games that first year? I, I played 14. You're right. Like, I was pretty determined. I remember yeah. I played a year of senior footy in Tassie. I felt like I was okay, ready so to, to play against men. you were hit the ground running men. a bit more. 
But uh, I remember round one, we played Adelaide 1993 at the MCG, and I think Jeff Hogg, our full forward and captain, yeah, was out injured. Love, love Jeff Hogg. Remember Hoggy? Hoggy. Kicked 10 Kicked on 10 Mother's on, Day. That's it. <laughs> or was it the... Um, Mother's Day Massacre. The Mother's Day Massacre. He was out injured, and I remember knowing during that week that he wasn't going to play. And yep. I thought, gee, I might be a chance here. You know, trained pretty well on the Thursday night, but they actually picked a guy called Adam Slater to make his debut. I remember Slater. being filthy. I thought I, I thought I should have been yeah. picked. So I was probably a bit arrogant, I guess, thinking I was going to be you picked. Had that, you had, you had self-belief of, like, I did. you I felt thought, like you could do it. I yeah. thought I was ready. But anyway, yeah. they waited seven weeks and I played in round seven. Yeah, right. I, I remember 94. So I was yeah. 94, I'm grade six. Who were your favourite players? My favourite players were... My first favourite was Flea, and then I had I had number nine on my back. I had... I Not had, Wayne Campbell. I had Cambo's number <laughs> on my back. The 93, we won... Well, we made the grand final of the Foster's Cup. Yeah. You see I'm saying we yeah. all, like, yeah. I'm on, yeah. I'm on, I'm back, I'm back That there. was incredible, that Foster's Cup. It was 90,000 people yeah. at Waverley. To I remember, that. obviously, I wasn't playing. It was my first pre-season, but... We didn't get into the ground until half time. There were 10,000 people trying to get in. It was incredible. That's wow. when I realised how Something. big Richmond was. Yeah. You know, no success, one pre season grand final, and yeah. it was incredible. Tell me about the early stages of 95. So, 95 in my, in my yeah. world is still my favourite year. Tigers won the first seven or eight games, but it was the it was the hot ticket in town. Yeah. And you're, you're, the, you're the marquee forward. And I think you'd kick 27 goals, three behind the first yeah. eight or nine rounds on fire. What, what was it like for, for a young Tigers fan, fanatic, yeah. to then be sort of at the centre of that sort of hurricane? Well, I guess I touched on it with that 93 um, Foster's Cup grand final. You, you knew the power of Richmond if they yep. got up and going. You could just feel it and the fans were feeding off it. We had a young group coming through all together, Campbell, yep. Daffy, um, Stuart Maxfield, guys yep. like that. And we just got on a roll. I remember the North Melbourne game. Yeah, I was I think there that we, night. It was six or seven goals to nothing in about ten minutes, and that's when you thought, "Hang on, we we could be a good team this it was like year." It shocked the football. Yeah. That, that sort of shocked the football world. Yeah, it did. For us young players, it was very simple. Swoop was a great motivator. The game plan was simple. It was yeah. the Tommy Hafey, get it in quick. Get it in quick. Numbers to the fall of the ball, and it was just a, a fun time to be playing. Yeah, you felt that because I mean, our, our the Murphy family tradition was to park our car. Not we had friends that lived just off Swan yeah. Street, not far from here, and we'd walk to the MCG yeah. with the sort of sea of yellow and black, the whole thing sort of building, and then and the tigers on fire. Yeah. But then it goes for you, goes horribly wrong. Yeah. Round nine, round or nine. ten, round yeah. nine. At the SCG. Yeah, so I went for a mark near the boundary line. I was playing on Andrew Dunkley. And as I went up, I got pushed in the back. And I sort of, I'm going to have to stop straight away. So I sort of stopped and stiff-legged and, you know, did the hyperextension, crashed into the fence. And I felt it. I knew that I'd done something serious, but I went into a bit of denial. I tried yeah. to stand up and it was a photographer's chair. So I went and sat on the chair and waited for the docs and that to come out. But I knew I'd done it, yeah. yeah. Stu Wigney broke his ankle in the same, same game. Same day. And the Tigers, yeah. that, so they, they bravely, without, without their, their gun, young full forward, centre-half forward, and, and they make the finals. Yeah. Um, was it hard to watch? Um, not really. No, I think when you're young, you feel a bit invincible. So you would have been, what, 21 or 22? 20. Yeah. And I just 20. felt... 20? Yeah. Wow. And I just felt... Now I'll get over this knee and we'll be yeah. in the we'll be in the finals next year. That's yeah. what I felt. Yeah. Um, and it didn't happen. So you're coming off the back of a knee reconstruction. Yeah. You're 21 years old, and you kicked 91 goals. Is that? I know you had other great years, but yeah. I, I think that's one of the great forgotten years of of a footballer. Do you remember how many tackles you had for the for the entire season? Well, clearly, if you're asking, <laughs> not many. I'd say six. You've got to Six. be joking. Six? Six for That's the year. That's more than I thought, actually. <laughs> Should have, surely I had more than that. Jack Graham, I think, from Richmond last year, I think he had 13 in his first game, Jack Graham. So um, that's embarrassing, isn't mm. it? Mid-90s Melbourne. We're at the Corner Hotel here, yeah. the home of many a rock and roll gig. And But you, you did immerse yourself in in Melbourne culture and, and the yeah. rock and roll scene. Was, was, that, um, was that part of it? My best mate, Benny Harrison, was playing yep. at Carlton. And we said, oh, let's move into the inner city. So myself, Benny and Brad Pearce and a guy called Tony Lynn that yep. played at Carlton. So I was living with three Carlton players oh, in the right. mid-90s. So 
around Brunswick Street there, a lot of little band venues. I love music, so... Had always loved music? Yeah, always loved it as a kid, but growing up in Tassie, you don't get a lot of opportunities to go and see live music. Yeah. Actually, walking in here today, we saw the Diesel poster, Johnny Diesel. Johnny Diesel. And it reminded right. me, my first concert was the Launceston Velodrome, and I was in about <laughs> year eight or nine, Johnny <laughs> Diesel and, and the Injectors. So wow. That was my escape from footy on a Saturday night, go and watch a, watch a yeah. bit of music. And that was the only time you really switched off from footy. Yeah. And uh, you know what it's like, it's all mm. consuming. Did it sort of take a toll on you, the, um, the, the judgement and the expectation and the, you know, the, the pressure to perform? Well, I guess it was before social media. Yeah. I, I don't know how guys put up with that now mm. because everyone judges you and yeah. people tag you in to a negative comment. <laughs> I don't understand that, do you? <laughs> no. Like, no. So I, I want to say, I want to talk about Bob Murphy's game yeah. on the weekend. I didn't yeah. like it. So I'm going to tag him in. Yeah on Twitter and telling me how bad he played. Yeah. Like that, I just don't get that. So we didn't have that pressure. People can be cruel, can't yeah. they? Yeah. I put more pressure on myself probably yeah. than what the supporters could. Yeah. I felt if you played well, I put more pressure on myself to play well the next week yeah, and right. it was just sort of just snowballed. Keep going up. Yeah, yeah. The, the so expectation going up. You had to get away from it for a few hours each week. Yeah. Fast forward a few years when you when it's the we're in the full Rich O man phase right. now of the What's that? Big baseball? time. Yeah, the the, the Big celebrity phase of, of the Rich O Man. So mid nineties, Pearl Jam, the grunge yeah. thing. You came through the grunge era. Yeah. Tell me about the time you met Eddie Vedder. When I retired at the end of two thousand and nine, Pearl Jam were actually in town, sort of the day after I retired. And there was a newspaper article, obviously, on the retirement and blah blah blah. And I was heading to Pearl Jam the next night, so I was pretty relaxed. I was I was weight of the world off my shoulders. Yeah. I'd, I'd finished playing footy. Was looking forward to getting on with the rest of my life. And I'm sitting there at Eddie Head Stadium with a mate of mine, Dave, and another friend, Fiona. All of a sudden, I hear my name. I said, is that what I think it is? And people turned around and said, did he just say that? Eddie Vedder had mentioned my name and talked about me retiring. And I'm like, what's going on here? This is not happening. This is surreal. And Eddie had read in the paper, and he takes an interest in, in the what's going on. Yeah, you know, and what's happening around the local and he, town. he sort of said, who's this guy? And the tour manager said, well, I know he's going to be here tonight. And it just sort of was a perfect storm of situations. That's so good. He dedicated Given to Fly to me. <laughs> and I'm still... Just like, that's it. I'm, I'm like, like, this is like one of my heroes. Yeah. You know, we went backstage and I'm having a beer and Eddie and all the band are there, but I hadn't met him at this stage. And Were you doing was... your best sort of play it cool or were you just, you just was, sort of... Yeah. yeah. And I thought, I'll get a photo with him. I'm doing that now. Yeah. Don't be <laughs> silly, bro. I'll get a photo with him. Yep. I'll have one beer and I'll leave. And finally, you know, he came over and I shook his hand and I thought, that's it, I'm done. And I was about to leave and a guy from the Cosmic Psychos, Ross, the lead yeah. singer, who's a Richmond man, good Australian band. Yeah, great, and, great Australian um, band. I said, Ross, all right, mate, I've got to get going. And he said, no, nah, we're going to go back to the hotel and have a beer with Eddie. So fast forward, next thing I know, I'm in Eddie Vettis Tarago with his security guard, <laughs> Ross Knight from the Cosmic Psychos, my friend Fiona, who had organised it all. And we're driving out of Eddie Head Stadium with Eddie Vetter. And the thing, you know, they say you should never meet your heroes, but yeah. this was the opposite, mate. Yeah, he, right. he could not have gone up in my expectations anymore. So we're pulling out of Eddie Head. There's a group of Pearl Jam fans that have been waiting for, you know, a couple of hours probably by this stage. He stops the Tarago puts down the window and signs autographs. So I thought, how good is this bloke? He could have driven past yeah, then. Yeah, yeah. Next thing we know, we're back at his hotel, bucket of Coronas, Eddie Vetter, Ross, Fiona and me. <laughs> how good's that? <laughs> it doesn't get any better than yeah. that. Yeah. You played 280 odd games yeah. in the end. Was there, was there part of your career where you ever felt misunderstood. There was a part there was a part in that middle you tried so hard, but occasionally it would bubble over into what could be sort of spitting a tantrum the or spitting the dummy or a tantrum or a sort of some sort of blowout. Yeah. Did you feel did you feel it any part in that middle part? Did you, you enjoyed feel, them blowouts. Oh so, yeah. Didn't well, you? I gotta say, so the Friday it was often the Tigers were playing Friday night. And it was the Richo show. And we, like the Bulldog, we'd get together on training on the Saturday morning. And the talk would be about, did you see Richo last night? Because it would be either, you would have either kicked six or there would have been some kind of tantrum. But it was, it was, it was sort of captivating. But did you feel that, that, did you feel in that part that you were maligned at any point? 
No, probably sometimes she felt it, but I, I, I understood. I bought it on myself, really. I never could really get a handle on my emotions until yeah. probably I turned 30. Yeah. It was a late, late <laughs> development. <laughs> probably in my last four or five years, I felt like I harnessed that energy. I needed to be on edge to play well. Yeah. Um, I felt like I played my best when I was on edge, but yeah. sometimes it boiled over. The only thing sometimes that I felt a bit maligned with was that Sometimes I was taking that emotion out on myself, but yeah. people, and I did do it towards my teammates yeah. at times, clearly, um, but sometimes I was actually angry at yeah. myself and people thought that was people directed at teammates. Um, but I understand why. It didn't look good. I remember getting home on some of those Friday nights that you're talking about. Remember it was delayed, the broadcast yeah, was yeah, delayed yeah, yeah, by it was, now. Yeah. And you'd get home and the broadcast would still, still be going. on. I remember getting home and seeing, you know, some highlights of me carrying on, yep. and I'd, I'd actually be embarrassed. I'd go, what was I thinking, you know? Yeah. But did, I, the I, David Roden one was the, the one. I felt yep. it was his first game and, you know, I probably went over the top and it just didn't look good. It was a bad yeah. look and I actually got dropped and it was yep. the right thing to do. Yeah, yeah. That, was, that was a big one, wasn't yeah. it? Getting dropped back to the two. And that did, was probably the wake-up call, I'd say. Yeah. yeah. But you, you, you did play with that, that raw emotion. It was almost like I saw it as like a child. You had a childlike joy of yeah. the game where you just sort of let it all out. And so much of um, modern footy now is about there's no characters left in the game. Yeah. Well, we got to see who you were right from the start all the way through it. But then because you played for so long, I think the appreciation just grew and grew and grew. That your passion for that footy club and and your effort to try and win yeah. didn't just win over the football part. It kind of it, it made you this other kind of figure in the game. Did you feel the love come back to you in the um, latter part of your career? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for saying that. It's Bob. true. Yeah, I, yeah think, I really believe that. I think towards the end, I did my last probably my last year. I've, I felt like, oh, hang yeah. on, people will understand me a bit better now. Yeah, I heard, I heard a story one from a couple of teammates. I did, can of I just yours. clear this up though, Bob? I did make a goose of myself <laughs> <laughs> more often than not. I don't want to look like I'm saying that. No, no, no. no. You, were, you were captivating to what you always were. I was talking to a couple of, couple of your old teammates and, and mates of mine, and Ben Harrison was a good source for this interview, but he was telling me about a time when Robert Walls was, was coach, and Walls is a f famously hard. Hard but hard, fair. Hard, hard but fair, fair. Hard man. And some feedback, feedback in the, yeah, in the 90s was oof. tended to be not positive feedback. No, no, it wasn't the old sandwich of compliment. No. Feedback, it's different now, compliment. isn't it? I actually quite enjoyed when the coach got into me. It actually yeah, gave fired you a you bit up. of a yeah. yeah. But there was, I remember they were, they were saying in the Tigers meeting room, there's the Nilex sign out the window. Yeah. <laughs> there was a couple of times I, in a few bad reviews, and you, you'd sort of sit there and. Just have a You'd little have to, look at the Nilex and look up a little deep breath. It was my sanctuary, the, the <laughs> Nilex clock. Um, players know when it's right, yeah. your criticism is yeah. right, and I thought more often than not it was You went it was right. Yeah. So again, taking back to, so I was the young Tiger supporter and patchy form, but there was yeah. always this thing of one day Richo, you know, imagine if he could kick 10. That was, that was sort of like the subplot of how did the Tigers go, but how did, how did Richo go? That's how sort of, that's yeah. how, that's how much of a fan I was. I had good seats for the day you kicked 10. It was, was a good day. I was out there. What's a perfect day at the MCG kicking 10 goals like? I guess if you're a forward, you know, in the back of your, in your selfish part of your mind, and my, a lot of us forwards have that selfish well, got, part I, of I, But I think that's, that's part of it. It's like the, yeah. the centre half forward, full forward is that they're the front yeah. men. They're the Mick Jagger. Yeah, so you do have You've got to be a bit of a peacock. You have a bit of that about you. It's not you the same do. for half-back flankers. You do have we're a bit. We're Bill Wyman. The base players. Yeah. You, ho you <laughs> hold it all together, though. We're the base players, but we're not the front men. What was it like to kick 10? Um, I'd always had it in the back of my mind. I'd love to do it one day. I just never thought I would. I'd need yeah. 15 or 16 <laughs> shots at goal to do it, Bob. <laughs> but on that particular day, I, I got a few early, got confident, and you sort of go for a mark, and you mark it, and you think, oh, how do I mark that sort of thing? And yeah. it was one of them days. It just sort of, everywhere you went, it sort of followed you a little bit. So, yeah, it was good. And, and the Richmond fans were, in, were incredible that day. And we had a win and, yeah, it was a good feeling. Yeah. But the thing I remember most is I had three of my best mates over from Tassie, Belly, Fu and, um, and Stigger. And they were sitting in the grandstand and, you know, I just couldn't wait to see them after the game. We went up to the Swan Hotel just up the road here. And I think we had about 10 schooners after it, so it was a good day. 
that was a conflicting day for me. <laughs> I was just like, gee, this, you know, this is going horribly wrong yeah. for the Bulldogs. And everyone going, Ooh, that was a good one. <laughs> I did get a bit cocky towards the end of that game. <laughs> I think... <laughs> I think Dars might have wandered down at one stage, and I thought, surely they're not sending you down there, Dars. <laughs> Got a bit arrogant. Yeah. Anyway, it was a fun day. It's a fun day. The after match at the Swan was. I was better, about though. to say, what was that like? What yeah, was the fun. What was the night like? Yeah, good. The Tassie boys had a good time, and yeah, it was yeah. fun. So they should have. So yeah. they should have. We don't. Yeah. We don't. You've got to celebrate the little wins in footy. Do, I they, think. do you still? You're still able to do that now? I, uh, I wonder. I think you it's can. starting to come back a little bit. Teams and clubs now. are... Uh, Realising you have to, you got to, you, you have to nourish it. the yeah. group, and you, ha yeah. you don't have to go out and you know put a keg on. But no. it, I think you, that those times are special because we do have a habit of dissecting a loss to within an inch of its life, and then a win. You just, I just move yeah. on. It's like no, that's not that's un got to, that's not balanced. You had to have a few hours where you just sort of released yourself a little yeah. bit. That's what I loved about you know being able to go out with a few friends after the game and, and chill out. It was the only time of the week you Turn switched off. A off. Little bit, yeah. yeah, so. I hope they still do that. Yeah. I think they do. Did did you feel the love in the room when you were when you were charging for the Brownlow? It was quite. It became a television event of you know you, that Richo might win the Brownlow. Yeah. It became an, a whole other subtext of the night. Did yeah, you feel was, Did you feel it in the room? Was, yeah, I did. And I guess I was really humbled by it. Yeah. Um, I remember around twenty. I think I was myself, Simon Black, um, Coons. We we're all around the same boats. Yeah. But in the brown, you've been ever a lot, Bobby. In the brown line, there's like a form guide in the room. Yeah, right. So you can see that. And on the form guide, it showed that Richmond won the last two games. Yeah. People in the room were probably thinking, well, it's I'm a chance to get yeah. some votes. But I was sitting there knowing they were my worst two games of the year. I played horribly in the last two games, so I felt really relaxed. I knew I couldn't win it, yeah, so right. I actually enjoyed the moment, and yeah, it was really good fun. I actually took Chris Newman was my date that yeah. night. And knew he had never been to the Brownlow. He's a young, a young player. Yeah. And the last votes they read out uh, were the Richmond game, round 22. They get to the three votes, and who gets the three votes? Chris Newman, my date for the night. So it was a pretty funny way to end. It kind of paints a picture, though. I think of, of what I was sort of talking about before about the, the how it took a while, I think, for the the footy public to really understand you. And and once they did, they couldn't heap enough love on you. And the Brownlow was one of those. But that that year, middle of that year, two thousand eight, we you and I played against each other in the Victoria yeah. Allies game. And I and I remember the game itself was kind of like there wasn't a lot of tackling. No. So you and I were loving life. Circle work. Yeah. But the one thing I do remember is after in the we're at the Waterside Hotel. And it was, for me, it was a real buzz to be amongst yeah, the, the best of the best. But I do remember that everyone wanted to have a beer with Richo. You were, I, I, it was, I do remember nah, that. It was Brownie, I reckon. Well, he was Jonathan the, he Brown. was, Brownie was the alpha, but it was like, it was, everyone wanted a piece of you. I just, I, I do recall that sort of, everyone sort of hovering That was, around. that was really good. That's why I reckon State of Origin Yeah, I think there's good, something, and we need something. I think, I think players have got yeah. an appetite for some kind of representative footy. I think they have, footy. because that, I found that to be a really good memory, that, that yeah. to, like playing with Buddy Franklin. I yeah. thought, how good is this, playing yeah. with Buddy Franklin? Well, I got to play with Fev on the other side and... Fev was on fire. Too, Fev was on me. fire and, and even before the game, he was famously walking around the locker rooms because yeah. he was calling himself the Fevolution yeah. at the time. Yeah. He just kept saying, who's going to play on the Lush? He, <laughs> it's there ever been a more supremely confident <laughs> player like than that's the Lush? That's in a room full of like alpha stop? males, peacocks, big egos, and the and yeah. the, it was an, at another level. And then of course he goes yeah. out and, and he, wins did the, he medal. Win the medal. Yeah, he, he won did. the medal. He's taken one hand as who's going to stop the who's going to stop the loosh? Like thousands of other league footballers, you yeah. and I missed out on being premiership players ourselves. Yeah. But got to watch our clubs win the flag. What what was it like for you? Can you describe that feeling of being that little kid with your yeah. with your dad's scrapbook all those yeah. years ago to then witnessing the, the tiger charge and and that the, that glorious yeah. day? It was just incredible, just surreal. It felt surreal that whole almost the whole back half of that season when you started to think, hang on, something's happening. This is going to happen. What were you like du during the game? Were you like a cat in a hot tin room? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I remember sitting, the great Timmy Watson sitting next to me. I didn't yeah. say anything. I was meant to be broadcasting the game, but yeah. Timmy actually said, just, just, just enjoy it, you yeah. know. 
I remember what I said about 10 minutes into the third quarter, or I think Richmond were about eight or nine points up. Yeah. He said, you've got it. And I went, geez, you've gone a bit early here, Timmy. You were eight points up in the third quarter, but I just didn't want to believe. You didn't want to yeah, you wouldn't allow, allow yourself, yourself to, to believe yeah. and then be let down. But um, It's a pretty natural thing, I think. Just huge emotion, happiness. Yeah. Um, then I thought about my old man. I thought, geez, yeah. I wish he could have seen this. Yeah. Um, and just joy for all those Richmond supporters. That, yeah. was the, that was the biggest thing. And then the whole next few days, I went to Punt Road on the, the Sunday and I was a nuffy, just a complete <laughs> nuffy Richmond supporter. We all are. It was unbelievable. We all are. I actually sort of didn't sink in, though, for a few days. It didn't feel real. Yeah. And I remember I had a coffee on my own, or probably not a coffee at that point, but I was having a beer on my own and I just started crying on my yeah. own. I think it was on the Tuesday afternoon. And that's when it sank in. I yeah. thought, how good is this? Yeah. Yeah, well. But you had a you had a you had a role on the day. What, what was it like to hold the cup and present it to the you must have been must have been pretty special even to be asked, I imagine. I remember when Benny asked me, Benny Gale gave me the news. He said, Look, the clubs in the grand final have to nominate a past player to present the cup. And we've nominated you. And I thought, oh, you can't be serious. What about Burke and Waitman and Roach and Kevin Bartlett? And um, I thought, geez, this is incredible. I can't believe that I'm going to have this opportunity. And then I walked out of his office and I thought, hang on, it was before the prelim. <laughs> We've got to win a prelim yet, Benny. You've gone a bit early. <laughs> a great moment. Walked up there, Dimmer and Trent. I just thought, don't, don't hang around. Get off. It's not about you. So <laughs> gave the cup and, yeah, unbelievable. Um, Richo, the, the spirit of this whole show was yeah. for really for, for me to, to meet my heroes, whether it be, you know, Rob Sitch yeah. and Julia Gillard, Tex. Tex Burke, you know, rock and rolls, and you've come dressed as Tex today. I actually I appreciate that. Sorry to just cut you off. <laughs> <laughs> I got up this morning, I thought, I'm going to have to get a denim shirt out for this. <laughs> it was just like a little... But um, the show had to finish with you as as the oh, last guest because that. I, was a, I was a little kid, football fanatic, and I had your poster on where you were always yeah. my hero, and I, I call you a friend now and a Thanks, mate. mate. But you're still a hero to me, so it was just a fitting way to finish the show, mate. Thanks, Bob. Good on you, man. You know what? I'm sorry I called you champ. <laughs> <laughs>